I'm Deborah Prinzing, and uh, I'm so happy on behalf of Slow Flower Society to welcome all of you today to talk all about hellebores. And, you know, we've kind of tried a lot of different topics with the Slow Flowers member meetups, and we've, um, you know, kind of followed cultural issues and uh, business strategy and all kinds of things that we all coped with in um, 2020 uh, with COVID. But uh, in the last three or four months of our meetups, we've really focused on a particular uh, technique or, or uh, cut flower variety and brought in experts to talk about that. And it's really nice because it allows us to talk about the growing and cultivation as well as the design. And um, I've been talking about hellebores a lot with today's two guests here in the Pacific Northwest where we are, uh, hellebores are like the, the diva of the winter garden. So we're all um, really uh, obsessed with hellebores because it's the one of the most, um, like the only groovy thing happening in the garden right now. And I know that's the case for a lot of you. Um, so we've got Pam Youngsman from Poppy Starts and Riz Reyes of RHR Horticulture, and they're gonna kind of go back to back. Um, before we get Pam to start, I just wanna, uh, you know, tell you that she's gonna be showing a PowerPoint. So uh, we will probably, not, I will probably not interrupt her and ask questions. I'm gonna just let her go through her presentation. But if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll do a Q&A after, and then we'll pivot over to Riz and see um, his glorious floral designs with hellebores. Um, and then Karen uh, Thornton, our operations manager, is going to put some links in the chat uh, to the replay video from last month when we had uh, Rachel Johnson from Simply Grounded. So we had an Ikebana presentation, which was so beautiful. So that video is available. And then um, uh, just keep yourself on mute and put your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So, uh, I want to introduce Pam Youngsman. I met Pam through the Slow Flowers Creative Writing Workshop. She was one of the uh, people who took, a, took that class last fall, and we soon realized we were both here in the Pacific Northwest, and I was so curious about why she was interested in uh, doing more writing. Pam has an early start in the horticulture industry. In 1966, her parents founded Skagit Gardens in Mount Vernon, Washington, and she grew up in a greenhouse world of propagation, transplanting, and finishing. Over the years, she developed a passion for horticulture and for sourcing and introducing exceptional plant varieties. After serving in the role of sales manager, manager there for many years, Pam left and started Poppy Starts in 2014, a company based in Washington that sources products and sells young plants to growers and including to some flower farmers. Hellebores are one of the few long flowering perennials that bloom in winter and early spring, adding much needed color to the darker time of the year. For this reason, they quickly became a favorite genus of Pam's. Today, she works with breeders and young plant suppliers to help introduce and supply Helleborus and other starter plants plants to greenhouses and nurseries in America. So welcome, Pam. Thanks for bringing your world to ours. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So I'm going to share my screen. So Deborah had asked me to talk a little bit about the categories that I like to break hellebores down into for the varieties that I work with. But before we dive into that, I thought we could spend a few minutes on talking about hellebores in general. Hellebores are the absolute star of the winter garden. And if you're here in the Pacific Northwest, you know that we've had rain and gray, uh, gray days since, I think almost every day since last October. And so for me to be able to run out into my yard and just pick a little, or cut a little bouquet of hellebores, it just makes my day and it brings me so much joy and brings color into my house. Um, hellebores are a really long lived perennial. They're a shade loving woodland plant they're not a plant that you want to cut. It's, it's not a cut and come again type of offering, uh, like a zinnia or a cosmos. They shoot up at their flowers, they do their show, and that's it. That being said, the flowers will hold on for a long time, depending on what varieties you have. And hellebores need some cooling in order to initiate buds. So they do well for a lot of Canada and a lot of the USA. Um, there's a few areas that they won't do well. If you're in Miami or Houston, um, you can buy in hellebores from other areas, but what you'll probably end up with is foliage 
in the following years and no flowers. You can also put Hello Wars in containers. This is actually Riz's container here on the left. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is hellebores don't do much active growth over the summer. So they don't need a lot of care or a lot of attention. And the, the problem I hear about most often is people will overwater their hellebores in the heat of day and they'll rot out. So make sure that you water in the cool times. I, I always water my hellebores in the morning and you want to let them dry down between waterings, but not go all the way dry because you could lose them that way. Another thing I wanna point out here is when it gets below freezing, hellebores often look like they've totally collapsed. And this variety is cinnamon snow. And I took this picture a few weeks ago. You can see how it, it looks sad here. And then when the temperatures got back in above freezing, it perked right back up. Um, I was actually in Boston one year and a grocery store had gotten in a rack of hellebores and they were planning to dump them because they looked like this. It was seven degrees out. <laughs> so we had this conversation. They're a wonderful cut flower. Uh, the key to cutting them is to cut them at the right time. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later and I'm sure Riz will be touching on that too. I've also tried pressing them and I think that works well. I don't know if the lighter colors work as well as the dark colors. And I've also, I had one stem that I dried and I, I'm not sure if that works well or not. Maybe one of the dried flower experts could weigh in on that. I love floating hellebores in a bowl or in my bird bath. And one of the really cool things about doing this is orientalis types. You can see these right here are orientalis types. If I were to cut stems of this flower when it's this young it would last in a vase for a few hours and then it would collapse so this is really a fun way to enjoy uh orientalis hellebores when they're young and not have to wait till they're older and mature so the deer typically stay away from hellebores you know i have heard a few stories of, of deer eating hellebores but for the most part they don't touch them this is a planter at one of my friend's house and you can see the deer absolutely feasted on everything and didn't touch the hellebore. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and there are a few pests, hate to have to bring this up, but aphids are probably my biggest problem. And I do see a few slugs on my hellebores here and there. Um, should also mention that they are poisonous, so don't eat them. And I haven't heard stories of dogs and cats eating them, but it's just something to be aware of. So hellebores are known by many common names. There's a Christmas rose, winter rose, snow rose, and Linton rose, and Easter rose. And so when I'm working with growers, I often break down, break this down into the three categories. Um, this isn't gospel. This is just the way I do this because it makes it easier for growers to select what varieties or series will work well for them, for their environment, for their production um, setup, and for their customers. And so the first one here is the Christmas rose. And these are the earliest to bloom. They're often blooming before Christmas. And the flowers are a nice pure white, which works really well with holiday colors. And uh, they probably aren't the greatest for cut flowers. Um, they, they are really kind of tricky. They, they start out as white and then they get to this kind of chartreuse color and then they end as kind of a candy apple gray, this, or candy apple green. This one ran out of water, so it's a little wilted. But if you do cut it at this stage, it will last for a couple weeks in a vase. And then the next category, this is a huge category for me. There's a ton of new varieties coming into this um, mid time right here. And this, these varieties are blooming right now for me. Uh, the Hoyer Gold Collection and the Ice and Roses series are really, really strong, robust plants. 
They have great thick leathery foliage that doesn't get diseased like some other, well, it doesn't usually get diseased like some of the other um, categories of hellebores. And there's also the frost kiss series, which has really interesting foliage and is a little bit later blooming than the gold collection. The range of colors in this category are perfect for Valentine's Day. You get the whites, pinks, reds, um, rose colors, and the red flowers hold their colors really, really well as they age. And these, these varieties work really well for cuts. Um, a lot of them have a really nice long stem and are heavy, heavy flowering. And then we'll move over to the Linton Rose. And uh, this is Riz's picture that was posted on Instagram. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But in this category, you have a super wide range of colors. It's almost a rainbow of colors of single and double blooming flowers. These are typically from seed. And uh, when, when I see posts on social media about uh, plants receding everywhere, this is the category that people are talking about. Uh, I'll see people comment and say, hey, you know what? My uh, Christmas rose isn't doing that. And the reason why is the Christmas rose and the winter and snow rose varieties that I work with are from tissue culture. So they're almost sterile where the uh, orientalis types are typically from seed. And so those are the ones that recede. And if you don't want them to recede, you just wanna make sure to cut the flower when they're, um, when they're mature and forming that seed pod. So just a few examples of each, each of these categories. This is Jacob, and this is the, probably the most popular variety used for holiday sales. It's a little bit easier for growers to work with to get in, in color for um, the timing of selling for Christmas. And it can be used in your home, but a couple of things, hellebores really like cool weather. So if your home's 75 degrees, what will happen is they'll start stretching after a while and they won't be happy for super long, but I've had them in my house for a month or so and they, they've done okay, but they do like that cool temperature. Um, in Europe, Hellebores are more of a holiday tradition than in America. We're still kind of building that. So right now, poinsettias outsell hellebores here. But in many countries in Europe, I've been told that they match or outsell poinsettia sales. And the other thing about these Niger types, um, they are a smaller plant usually than the um, other cat, the plants in the other categories. So prior to about 15 or 20 years ago, what was available in the US marketplace were primarily the orientalis types where the flowers hang down and uh, they're from seed. It was kind of a plant nerd, plant collectors type of offering. And in 2003, ivory prints came on the market and it was a total game changer. Uh, these, these are produced from tissue culture and you can see the crop is really perfect and they're first year blooming. And uh, so growers really started getting on board with offering hellebores. And I just had to include the picture of David Tristram. He was the breeder of this variety. And when I hear the words plant breeder, it, his picture always comes to mind for me. So pink frost was the first, one of the first varieties introduced in the gold collection. And you can see how heavy blooming it is here. This I believe is a second year uh, plant in this bed. And this picture was taken in February and the second picture here was taken in May. So the flowers hold on for a super long amount of time and look really good. Uh, pink frost ages to more of a dark rose color. And this is a top seller. It's an easy one to have in your garden. It's a real vigorous and strong performer. So the ice and roses 
series has been out for maybe five years. And there are a lot of new varieties coming into this series. All right, here I have the Ice and Roses White. Um, this is Picotty Rose, Red, and a new one that I'm super excited about called Barolo. And this is my first flower opening today. It was too early to cut, but I just decided we had to take one for the team. But what I love about this variety is not only does it have a dark burgundy stem, oh, it's not showing up well. The backsides of the foliage get a burgundy color to them. So you get this dark, deep red cherry colored flower that holds its color and then you get this as a bonus. And this is just a quick picture to show you how heavy flowering this series is and also how like how the white ages. Most white hellebores go through this stage where they, they come out white and then they get kind of a chartreuse color. And then when they're fully mature, they're a kind of a candy apple green. So the Frost Kiss series, um, this is a series where you get the really cool colors of foliage. And the variety being shown there is called Glenda's Gloss and it's super pretty. It comes out with this hot pink and kind of uh, white center and then it'll get hints of chartreuse colors to it as it ages. And this series is a little bit later blooming than the Ice and Roses series, maybe by a week or two for me. Most of my Frost Kiss varieties are buttered up. I do have one here that's in bloom. And Anna's Red and Penny's Pink were the first two introduced. And I talked to the breeder the, earlier this week. He sent me this picture of uh, Anna's Red going, uh, um, it, it, from a cut flower gar grower going to a wholesale market. So just a few cut flower tips on this series. You want to cut the flowers when they have one open flower here and the second and third buds are starting to open. And it's a great idea to cut these the night before you need them. And then put them, I put them in my garage because it's nice and cool and in water, of course. And then another thing that's important is you can add a little chlorine to the water, but do not add sugar um, as that attracts bacteria. You can also cut the foliage and that works in arrangements too. It holds up nicely. So the frost kiss series then you can see on the new foliage that emerges, it has the hints of pink. And then as it ages, it fades out. This is a uh, Pippa's purple and how it looks right now. And it has really, really thick leathery foliage. So I don't typically need to cut many of the leaves off of this series. So Orientalis types, oh, you know, we need to go back here for one moment because uh, <laughs> the questions have come up about where to get uh, Onyx Odyssey. So if you want the widest range of hellebores, if you want to buy those, I would recommend going to your local independent retail garden center. Uh, the box stores typically carry hellebores, but they'll usually do a smaller uh, collection of them and they tend to stay in this range. So if you do, if you look at mail order companies or if you're in Virginia or in Oregon and you can make it out to either Pine Knot or Northwest Garden Nurseries Hellebore sales, you'll see a nice collection of Orientalis uh, types available. Okay, so Orientalis types, these are typically from seed. The flowers nod down and they have thinner foliage than the other, other 
collections that we've just talked about. But you get that wide range of colors. You get the singles and doubles. And here's just a sneak peek of the Winter Jewels series in the double. Um, there's a lot of series available in the Orientalis types. There's the uh, Lady series, the Honeymoon, um, Wedding series, Mardi Gras series. So there's a lot of people involved in Orientalis types now. And they're usually hand pollinated. And one thing I want to point out here is there's variability in the flowers. You know, if these were done from tissue culture, you wouldn't see this variability. But here you see apricot blush has a little bit of the blush tones. And then this is also apricot blush and it has less of the blush tones. So keep that in mind. If you buy a hellebore when it's green, you're not guaranteed that this is what you're getting. So a few cut flower tips. Um, <laughs> this is just a quick visual for you. I cut these Niger types, a single stem, and within eight or 10 hours, this is what they look like. <laughs> so you really, really wanna make sure that the flowers are mature. You know, if you see them forming the seed pod, that's a good time to cut them. And I think Riz is going to touch on these a bit more. Uh, I like to submerge my cut, cuts in water. Uh, and partly just because we've had so many storms out here. Sometimes there's debris, sometimes there's slugs, and it's just a nice way to clean them. And I think it may actually help, help extend their vase life. And then this is a recipe that Linda Butler's uh, college class came up with after doing some trials. So if you want to screenshot that, I checked with her and that's perfectly fine for this group to have this recipe. That's so helpful, Pam. And we are going to, of course, have uh, the replay video for everyone to see as well. So um, if you missed it, there'll be a chance to get it later. That's incredible. So one question is, how much of the foliage can you cut before you set the plant back? Okay, so on the Frost Kiss series, it's recommended that you don't cut the foliage until you see that first flower up. Um, and I think you'll find that you don't have to cut as much of the foliage off on these as you do on the Orientalis types. Um, the Orientalis types, it's kind of recommended to do those cutbacks and clean up in like November, December timing. And then um, it looks like some folks are looking for some wholesale resources. I don't know, Pam um, and Riz, if you guys have suggestions or maybe if others can just put some stuff in the chat, but um, besides just locally, um, what are some wholesale, yeah. wholesale options? Yeah, so that's, that's what I work with every day. Um, I represent those suppliers. Uh, for hellebores, I use James Greenhouses, Skagit Hort, uh, PPNL, um, Walters Gardens has some Orientalis types. Those are most of my main, the, the varieties that we talked about today, those would be the sources I would Great. recommend. And then a follow up to that is how late in the year are they typically available as cut stems from grower or wholesaler? Uh, I'm going to jump in. This is Deborah. Uh, part of the, part of the thing that we're seeing is it's sort of a new cut flower category. And so uh, at least at the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market, most of the cut hellebores um, are grown by Jell Mold Farm, which is right down the street from where Pam is. And they, uh, the inventory just gets gobbled up really quickly. Um, I wouldn't say they're out yet. Riz, do you know? Well, um, in terms of wholesale sources, the only, um, Pam and I talked about this. Um, what you'll typically see in um, the wholesale market, a lot of them are grown um, like overseas um, uh, and they're typically the, um, oh gosh, see if I can find an example. Um, they're, they're smaller flowered, kind of greenish in color. And um, so they, um, they're, they're kind of small. They're, they're not really used as like a focal flower. Yeah, they, um, so this is one selection that's sort of an exaggerated version. You're going to kind of see one that's kind of um, 
kind of green with a little bit of kind of you know purple blush to it, and they're often um, as more used more as an accent versus a um, a focal flower. Are but, they coming um, in? Are they coming in from Holland? Is when you said overseas? I believe so. Denmark I should... too. And Denmark. In Denmark, okay, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of you know what you're um, what you're seeing, and I think what those growers are finding are uh, are what's basically going to last. So it's one of those. So to me, the hellebores are the quintessential like slow flowers, basically, because um, they're very. Um, you just you should just grow them, basically. <laughs> Sort of what we um, what we do because as Pam mentioned and Pam that was fabulous that was a wonderful primer to to hellebores and you you've covered really excellent points especially for this uh, for this group um, but yeah they're um, they're very resilient and really tough and what makes them spectacular is they are so hardy they're not just a flower that uh, can grow in the Pacific Northwest or you know just one region you can um, you know, minus the warmer regions, you know, where we're very fortunate to have, um, you know, these flowers in the winter time. So actually here, this particular variety, Pam, can you tell which one this is? Oh, that might be pink frost. I, I don't know. I, it's a little smaller than pink frost. Did I bring uh, that one? Is that from you? Me? know, it may be like Merlin. Um, I don't know if you grow Merlin, but it looks like Merlin to me. Yeah, yeah I anyway, have Merlin. Yeah, so this is um, basically what you'll typically find wholesale, um, and and I've been seeing them almost um, like year round, and I'm assuming they're also coming in from the southern hemisphere as well. But anyway, yeah, it's um, it's one of those plants that if you do have a garden, um, and it's you should have a few hellebores, um, and you know to have in the garden, but and also uh, to cut, so um, doesn't get fresher than that really. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's changing too, as more, as hellebores are gaining popularity in the U.S. In Europe, they know them. And yeah. so there are a lot of commercial cut flower growers there. Um, I'm working on collecting some information that's helpful for those who are starting in that um, arena here. Um, but I do think we're going to see more and more of this type of offering. You know, some of these new varieties have a super long stem and they're heavy flowering. And right. you can edit them out and use them as you wish. But I think it's just, we're just starting. Mm -hmm. that. Wow. Well, I think uh, that Pam and Riz, that that is so f fabulous first half of our presentation. But I realized I didn't officially introduce Riz. So I'm going to uh, maybe Pam have you turn off your uh, PowerPoint. And um, thank you so much um, for, as Riz said, a fabulous primer. Um, I want to make a couple announcements before we pivot to to Riz because Nisha's let me know that there are a few of you in the um, on the call who have not identified yourself by your business name, and uh, you can't really be identified in the drawing for our giveaways if we don't have that. So please take a moment and change your um, your name on your on your screen or on the chat so Nisha can identify it because she's collecting the names of everyone who's in the. Um, in the meetup today and we have like seven giveaways. So we wanna make sure we know who we're giving them to. Um, and then I'm gonna introduce uh, my good friend, Riz Reyes. Uh, Riz uh, is um, no stranger to Slow Flowers members. He was a speaker at the first Slow Flowers Summit in 2017. He was a designer of one of our fabulous botanical couture looks for American Flowers Week and just a, a dear friend. Um, but a little bio about Riz, an early curiosity about fruits and flowers in his native Philippines and an obsession for rare and unusual plants at a very early age has resulted in a thriving horticulture career. And Riz integrates gardening, teaching, designing, and cut flower growing, and also design. Um, he once told me that his true interest in gardening began as a seven-year-old watching public television to learn English and gaining an appreciation for the natural world where the art and science of growing plants captivated him. Riz has a BS in environmental horticulture and urban forestry from the University of Washington. After graduation, he logged several years working for the University of Washington's Botanic Garden Center for Urban Horticulture, as well as running his own business, RHR Horticulture, where he designs, consults, and maintains gardens he helps create. Riz gardens in an, in an environment that unveils an overwhelming 
diversity of plants each season. That's his favorite thing about living in the Pacific Northwest and enjoying our moderate climate and cultural conditions. Since 2015, Riz has been at, with McMinniman's Hospitality Group, and I don't even know your current title now. You were garden manager, but I think it's you got some other bigger promotion. <laughs> It's um, the same. No, it's the same. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to promote you. Um, McMinniman's Anderson, Anderson School is in uh, a suburb of Seattle, and it's a, a, a hotel, brewery, and pub where the gardens wow the guests. And many of the plants that Riz tends to, including hellebores, make their way into vases of his own creation. <laughs> so uh, I'm just so happy that you're going to talk about designing with hellebores, Riz, because I think there's a lot of questions. And um, as you said, you're urging people to grow their own because that's really how you get more hellebores for your floral designs. Um, so take it away and, and show us what you've got. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. So I am actually at work. Um, so <laughs> I'm in one of our meeting rooms right now. At, um, uh, so we just started up um, indoor dining. We're at like 25 percent you know, capacity at our restaurants here. And um, anyway, um, uh, I, we have a meeting room, so hopefully no one walks in. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, it, um, so I'm at work, so uh, I have to do something sort of work related. So I am putting together um, a centerpiece uh, for you all um, that's going to go in our hotel front, uh, front desk in our front lobby. So um, I've um, assembled um, something that you all um, have done or uh, plan to do or will do. This is um, kind of um, how I like to arrange hellebores. And it's basically using everything from the garden and, uh, and just showcasing the variety um, that, they, uh, that they possess. So uh, I'll break down the, um, the mechanics of this um, in, in, in a moment, because that's really the most important aspect of designing with hellebores is having good um, strong mechanics and each one uh, each floral designer has their own technique uh, their own ways and I'm always finding uh, different ways to um, to arrange and to design and to figure out what works especially when it comes with uh, when it comes to these flowers that have become so uh. um, uh, temperamental <laughs> um, you know in a vase because as uh, people discover them, and especially as a gardener, it's very tempting to to see them outside in the uh, in the cold dead of winter and wanting to bring them inside. And you know, you, you put them in a vase, and then, as Pam mentioned in her you know, in her um, little experiment there, up they wilt. So it's uh, helpful, I think, to grow them so you really understand how when you understand how a plant grows. I think it's the best way um, to determine how well they, uh, to use them and how well they hold up in, in a floral arrangement. So, uh, you know, a design like this, I think the framework is, um, is pretty much um, like how I like to teach flower arranging. And it's basically like designing a garden. So you start with um, your, your backbone basically of, of plants. And so I'm gonna show you another arrangement that I assembled with my framework and mechanics. So already it looks, you know, fantastic, but um, so the hellebores will just be a final touch. But what you can see here is um, a framework of various trees and shrubs that we have out in the garden. And it's really important, in, um, especially when it comes to placement of your, of your hellebore flowers. Notice I've used a lot of branches. And this is critical because as Pam mentioned too, a lot of the hellebores that you'll see tend to um, have this sort of, um, you know, drooping action. So by having a lot of these different branches, so what I've used here, um, um, are actually um, uh, flowering plum. It's a very common landscape shrub here. So they're still in bud. So actually by using them in a floral arrangement and bringing them inside in a couple of days, these will pop into flower and the whole arrangement will look completely different because it's in this, covered in this cloud of pink. So, um, but, uh, so it's beautiful in that respect, but it also provides a very helpful mechanic in uh, arranging with flowers because you can take advantage of these um, branches. So you basically develop a network of them and by having these branches, then you can manipulate the flowers to stand up and up or out as you need it. And the same thing too, if you're um, arranging, 
grab a hold of a branch like this where um, um, it, you, it forms a Y. And oftentimes when I need a certain flower to sort of face a certain way because it's gonna be a focal point um, to, the, to the design, I'll place that flower gently in, in that branch so it faces out and where I need it to be. So one simple um, little trick I've, I've discovered. Um, so I'm gonna break this down further to show you how I started with this. Um, our good friend, <laughs> the chicken wire or, um, uh, so different variations of this. There's um, the, the pillow that uh, you can purchase. Um, this is simply just from the hardware store. And what I have loved about using um, this coated um, chicken wire is um, the different ways you can manipulate it. Um, but again, valuable for hellebore designing because it provides a mechanic, very similar to what the branch will do to get these flowers to, um, to basically you know, face up and out the way where you need them. And they're also wonderful. Um, so in, in your vessel where here, actually the beauty of this is I can just arranging in this way, I can just simply lift this whole thing out and then have my design. So I'm gonna set that down for a second and show you the different ways. So there's the classic, I mean, this is kind of big, you don't really need it that large, <laughs> but what um, it'll allow me to do when I'm designing uh, in this method is now I have these different um, areas of uh, where I can uh, extend the, the design. So for example, if I need a, a large long um, centerpiece or something like that, um, I can use um, a mechanic like this that'll allow me to extend the um, you know the reach of uh, of the arrangement, so things can you know be used a little bit more vertically. Um, things can spill over, and what's beautiful about this, especially when you work with a larger piece and not just a smaller pillow, is you can manipulate this as needed. So by even forcing it down like that, now I have this area to um, you know to to work with. So then I can have flowers basically uh, drape over. And, uh, oh, you're fine, <laughs> um, um, like this. And then, um, and so it'll be supported. And of course you don't you know, really see it. Um, also, it's wonderful if you have vines to, um, to do their thing. What's also wonderful about this is you can also use it vertically. So like that, where you can extend and give height and dimension. Um, to your, your arrangement. So um, if you have a particularly long stem, for example. And then um, another little trick I learned from a dear friend and mentor, uh, you guys all know Hitomi Gilliam. So I took her, um, her class and learned a ton. And so, we, and so uh, a lot of the techniques I've learned and I use, I, I've learned from her, uh, from her courses. So we have our good friend, the water tube. Um, so this, when you have a mechanic like this, um, you can do, there's various treatments you can do to this. Um, basically you can attach wire with U glue and all that sort of stuff. And, um, I can get into more detail, but, um, but this will allow you to then insert a water tube. And so let's say you have a shorter stem because sometimes hellebores have really short stems. Um, then that'll allow you to, um, use the flower in that, you know, if you have a space in your arrangement where you need to, um, yeah, just needs one little piece, you know, so that can go into, um, into the water tube, you know, as needed. So, um, and the, what she typically does is she doesn't use the caps. She actually leaves those out. Um, we'll do a piece of uh, U-glue with wire or bind wire and then attach it, you know, there. So um, basically when the water level comes down, you just, you know, squirt water in there or you take them out and fill it up with, uh, with water. But it's a really simple way to, um, uh, to use them. So, um, so yeah, that's basically the mechanic I use. And so you can, you know, um, there's so much you can do with this and of course, you know, reuse it. Um, uh, I, so for the arrangement that I showed you earlier, I basically did um, like a weird twist dealy and just, you know, okay, well, what can I work with that? So you hardly see it. And so just let your imagination run and, 
do wonderful things with it. So, so Riz, we've got about um, like five to seven minutes. Do you yeah. want to design and I'll, I'll, if people post questions, I can read them to you or what, what's easiest for you? Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to talk about this one last piece a bit and then we can um, answer questions. Okay. The Great. easiest way to um, really use hellebores um, because they have this sort of, you know, wilt factor is to use the stems and keep them short. And this is a really simple um, uh, centerpiece I put together of the smaller pieces and the fatsia, um, this is, these are fatsia uh, seed pods um, that uh, uh, were grown by a friend of mine, Letitia. Um, hi, Adilidi. <laughs> um, and so she has them in her garden and make a wonderful, wonderful texture. But yeah, keep them short, keep them cool. And that's how you uh, uh, keep hellebores fresh in, uh, in your arrangements. Riz, I noticed that those uh, that are right in front of you, they do have uh, the seed pod sh uh, formation. Can you just point that out to people? I, they may not know that's a choice you made of when to cut, right? Yes, yes. So uh, Pam hinted at it in her presentation that the best time to use hellebores are when they're beginning to use their seed pods, um, uh, form their seed pods. So, and they turn slightly green. Because when most people, I'm gonna show you this, one, this is a single version of the, our famous Instagram photo. Most people <laughs> use hellebores like this with, uh, with the stamens present because you see the contrast and it really pops versus something that's, um, you know, sort of, well, this is sort of near its, um, its end, but something that's sort of really faded. So here's an example for you guys. So here's one where this is the stage where I would use them for an arrangement with the, with the seed pod starting to form. Um, and then you have um, this stage where it's sort of the, you know, the money shot, I guess you could say. Um, so when you have, when you harvest a, a flowering stem, I typically wait, this is a wonderful example um, from, from Pam, um, when the first few flowers um, have, uh, have reached the seed pod stage, then, um, then it'll have a better chance of holding up. And, and you can also have a few that have opened that, that do keep their, um, uh, their stamens. So that's really the best time um, to, uh, to use these hellebores. Great. I think somebody had earlier asked and we didn't get the answer about the maturity, you know, of a plant. And I think that's a good, um, you've kind of identified, just observe your plants and get, the longer you grow them, the more you're familiar with the right, the right formation of that seed pod. So yeah, those are kind of the basic, you know, uh, me mechanics of this. So I have one arrangement that's done for the front desk and I'll probably do one for the uh, kitchen, but it's a very straightforward, um, you, know, you know, deal. But it, the, my main, the point I want to you know, uh, bring, uh, highlight is making sure you have this, this structure, you know? So think of like the winter garden when it's just the trees and the shrubs and the twigs and um, to, uh, to make sure that that's done well and then, um, um, then the hellebores. Oh, Riz, uh, that's amazing. Take center stage. So you've got, you said that you had the flowering plum branches that were bare. What are the other elements that you've clipped? And you've clipped these all mainly from the landscape or from your friend's gardens, right? Correct. So yeah, these are from, uh, <laughs> from Letitia, from her garden. So these are kind of special. You don't really see them. Um, offered so all the more reason to to garden yeah and to grow it and of, I mean, of course many people know the fatsia for their foliage which is very popular for floral design um, so some of the other things we have here um, the purple leaves that you're seeing this is called laura petalum and it's the uh, Chinese fringe flower and it's an uh, broadleaf evergreen it's not super hardy um, but the, the foliage uh, is just fabulous and then um, there's actually some um, cetera here, um, the, the foliage here. Um, it's a cross between fatsia uh, and, um, and ivy. So uh, unusual oddity. Oh, and 1.2, um, so I love fragrance in my, in my designs, in my arrangements, in my gardens. So um, you don't see it because it's not open yet, but there's Daphne Adora here mm. that uh, will open in a few days, um, adding scent and fragrance. Um, and the little yellow flowers you see here, there's a Daphne relative called Edgeworthia. And, um, and again, wonderfully scented um, and uh, doesn't have leaves um, in the wintertime, but has these charming flowers. And we get 
questions every day when uh, when people see them out here in the garden. You've got and, some you've got some really mature uh, edgeworthias at McMinimins, though they are stunning, and I can imagine everyone who sees them wants to know what it is. Yeah, so it's fun. Even the little kids, you know, they come by and they, um, you know, they look at the flowers and they put their nose to it. It's just, um, you know, it's just super fun to see. So yeah, that's really it. I'm gonna, you know, finish this up. And um, but those are your um, your designing basics of using hellebores. They're um, really versatile, and also too, a lot of the flowers. Even though people people complain that they kind of droop and wilt, etc., but use them to your advantage you know they're very expressive on their own so by using them as you cut them in an arrangement you know really utilize their natural shape and form the wonderful curve that they um, that they possess and also to the color that some of the uh, varieties have in the back of the sepals here um, is, is very attractive so even though you're not seeing the flower full on it, there's still um, a beautiful interest there. And of course you mm. pair it with, you know, other things in your design. Um, there's a charm and elegance about them that we, um, that we shouldn't overlook. So here we wow. are. Wow. Oh, Riz, will you post that uh, arrangement on, on uh, your Instagram later so we can see it? Sure. All right. We'll put um, Riz's uh, Instagram on uh, the, the chat box too. Uh, let's put bring Pam back on and I'll just throw out some of the questions from um, our, our participants that you probably both have answers to. We'll just go for a few more minutes and then we will uh, wrap up. Um, okay, when is the best time of the year to plant hellebores? In the garden? I would, okay, I'm gonna do garden instead of production. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that people here who are flower farmers are probably, you know, gardeners as well. So, you know, I don't, is there much difference between planting in the garden and planting for production? Well, yes. Okay. So <laughs> there <Sorry>. is. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that, it, it varies based on where you're located and your sure. growing environment and all that. But, you know, a really, really great time to plant hellebores is in the fall when they're green, because they just focus on rooting in and, and uh, you know, growing. And then, most common, the most common time that people plant hellebores would be now. Um, a rule of thumb on a lot of hellebores is if you can dig, you can plant. Um, the rep for Hoiger that I used to travel with, that was what he would always say. And that kind of stuck with me. So if you can dig, you can plant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, you want to add anything on to that, Riz, about when do you plant? Yeah. Um, so, um, Pretty much here in the Northwest, uh, if, the if the ground's not frozen, you can plant. I mean, that's how hardy they, they really are. But one tip I have for buying them, um, so um, the, the, the clones, the different, the, um, the series, you know, the Hoiger hybrids, the Frost Kiss series, I mean, those are all clones and they'll all look alike. But my tip, if you're buying um, like the Winter Jewel series or any of the Orientalis types, is, um, and remember they're all seed strains, so they're all gonna vary in color a little bit. So what I like to uh, tell folks when I do my, uh, my the hellebore lectures and I talk about the Orientalis types, I tell them that, you know, to buy them basically when they're in bloom, because when you see a flower, you know, when you pick up a plant and you see the flower and you like it and you buy it, Basically, technically, that is, uh, even though it may look similar to all of the other, you know, Onyx Odyssey or Cherry Blossom, whatever names they might have, um, because they're grown from seed, they're going to vary a bit. So I tell folks that if you see a flower and you, you know, a plant with the flower and you pick it up of the Orientalis types, you know you like it, you're basically the only person in the world that has that, that exact genetically same exact flower. Oh, so it's pretty special to, yeah. you know, to, to, you know, to consider, but also because of that variation, um, buy, uh, uh, don't just buy one, get several. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can see the variation and you get a good representation of that stream. That's I a great advice. One, one really quick thing to that. Uh, if you do end up buying the Orientalis types green and you get it home and it doesn't bloom for you the first year, it may not be something that you did Orientalis types often take two years before you see bloom and sometimes even three years. So don't get discouraged. That's a good question because someone was asking about the lifespan of the plants and if planted from seed, how many years 
before cutting. So you've kind of alluded to the fact that it's a perennial. It might take three years to leap, right? Yeah. And, you know, planted from seed, a lot of the growers have gone to buying in um, plugs because plugs. Mm -hmm. it is such a long wait and it's tricky. So yeah, it's, okay. I would recommend buying a plant, not a, not seeding it yourself. Yeah. Somebody, somebody asked about uh, that their hellebore foliage turns spotted or dark. Is it, is there any way to avoid that? Or is it just the Pacific Northwest rainy weather? Maybe other parts well, of the country don't have that. It depends on the variety. You're, you know, you get into this gold collection and it's, you're going to have this lovely green foliage. Um, typically the worst foliage is on the Orientalis types and you'll want to cut that off. Okay. And also, if I may add to that too, my rule of thumb, we, we, we get this question all the time, you know, when do I cut back the leaves? Do I cut back the leaves? So my rule of thumb in the garden is if it looks hideous and you can't stand it, just cut it off, <laughs> really. It, it doesn't hurt the plant. Um, but then some, I mean, even the orientalis type, some of ours look really nice and they have this, they form a, a nice sort of, um, they're like um, guard petal or guard leaves, you know, that show off the flowers really well. And I, I keep them. Um, but in general, yeah, if you see that white, um, that spotting, um, it, when we do have a really wet, um, season. I mean, they are sometimes prone to some fungal uh, diseases. So it's just good sanitation when you, you know, when it looks ugly, just, you know, give some time to, to groom it and, and, um, and, uh, and to clean it up a bit. And that really helps. And also a plug for these, um, uh, for the new series of hellebores that are so densely blooming, they're it's like, uh, like, it's almost too much, you know, of, of hellebore. Can you believe that? <laughs> so that's where I think, yes, you know, let them mature a bit and cut them. And so, um, so you give a little bit more air circulation to the plant and that will help uh, with preventing any fungal diseases mm. that you might encounter. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll wrap up with one final question and then turn to some, the just announcements. Um, Mara is a grower outside of Philadelphia at the farm at Oxford. And she just said, if you could recommend two varieties for earliest blooming for cuts, what would they be? Do you, do you yeah. want me to go? Uh, I, well, you each can ask, you can each answer two because maybe we'll get four out of it. <laughs> well, for, that's a really hard question. But when you say earliest, I would say Anna's red would be one. Um, this is Ice and Roses red. But I'm also really excited that there is a new one coming out called Ice and Roses Early Red that is possibly going to be in color before the holidays. So um, if this is as robust as Ice and Roses Red, this might be one of my picks too. Great. Thank you. Is that the one of the varieties that we're going to do as the giveaway? All right. All right. There you go. Okay. How about you, Riz? What are your two favorite early bloomers that Gosh, you would use as cuts? I would use, oh, actually, so, um, uh, yeah, again, darn, really hard question. Uh, <laughs> um, in terms of early, early, like if you want to get really creative and, and have like, you know, um, um, like I would say the, the Niger, believe it or not, because um, so Pam mentioned uh, Boris Niger not really holding up so well, but when they do turn kind of greenish in color, they do hold up really well, um, but also use the stems when they're, when they're short. Um, and so then you can do, um, you know, really simple, you know, uh, centerpieces like this. So that would be, you know, your earliest. But then, yeah, I would agree with uh, with Pam about um, about Anna's red because it also has nice, um, you know, um, stem length to it. But also in terms of production, um, yeah, if you are growing hellebores as a cut flower, um, you can do what um, Ernie and Marietta do um, at Northwest um, um, Garden Nursery. Um, and they actually grow their hellebore, um, their breeding stock in large containers. So they're inside a poly house and they live in those containers for several years. So as long as they're watered and fertilized, you know, regularly, um, you know, especially during, um, you know, the summer into, you know, into the fall, um, you know, and they're lifted up on tables and because they're covered in a poly house um, uh, and just with a little hint of warmth, they will actually flower much earlier. Um, and um, so, um, so you can get them um, a little earlier uh, growing them that way as well. That's so, a great tip. So if somebody just didn't wanted to have all their hellebores in large containers and have them in uh, some kind of protected greenhouse. Mm -hmm. 
And you're yeah, saying the, tricky, po the though, poly house has a little bit of heat. It's not unheated, right? You know, that's a good question. I would assume that, you know, when it, um, it just depends on the outside temperature, you know, yeah. and when they're expecting a really hard freeze, they might turn it on. But, um, but basically you still want to keep them cool because um, they need uh, that cool. Yeah. They, they are our winter flowers and they want to be cool. Um, so, um, but yeah, I've, I've noticed that actually. So when I, um, use the hellebore plants at the, like the Northwest Flower and Garden Show, for example, it's a winter flower and garden show in February and you bring the hellebores in and you have a few open for, you know, opening day. And then by the end of the show, it's in like full bloom and they're like stretched out. Um, so they have long stems for cutting, <laughs> Yeah. but, um, so yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Oh my gosh, my head is spinning and I'm so delighted that we could have a little bit of a immersion in hellebores. An hour isn't enough, but it was definitely uh, enticing. Um, we have some giveaways. I want to first announce that um, la I've already posted, if you got the invitation, you saw who, who were the winners from our January uh, meetup giveaway. And I particularly want to thank Rachel Johnson of Simply Grounded. I'm going to get her name right uh, for donating a one-on-one -on -one coaching session uh, about Ikebana and uh, Kaifa Anderson Hall of uh, Plants and Blooms Reimagined received that. So ladies, I hope you've connected by Zoom. Um, this time we have, I announced that we had two three inch hellebore plants and Pam is, they're from Pam and they're the, she's going to talk about the varieties and she just told me she has two more. So she has four three inch plants to give away. So, um, you know, pray that Nisha draws your name and it's completely random, but Pam, do you want to just talk about those two varieties? There's two of each. So four people each will get one. Yes. So the first one is this three inch liner. This is the biggest size that I sell on the wholesale end of things, but this is the early red in the ice and roses series. And, um, I'll be really curious to see when this blooms. I've heard in Europe, they've had blooms in late October, early November. And so I'm very excited to see this. Skagit Hort grew this and um, donated these today. So that's wonderful. And then the second one, do you want me to go into yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, Onyx Odyssey is really, really quite sold out. Um, with the pandemic, people are going crazy over plants and especially hellebores, but um, we were able to get two of the three inch Onyx Odyssey liners. They're not quite ready yet, but in March sometime they will be available for two lucky ones. Wow. Winners. Wow. Thank you so much. That is so generous of you. And uh, I'm, I'm think we're going to inspire some new uh, people going to the nursery this weekend, looking for hellebores. Um, we, we, uh, I asked Pam and Riz for a recommendation on the best book that they could recommend for hellebores. And um, the book that we're going to give away is by, we've talked about Ernie and Marietta O'Byrne. They're if, um, like the god and goddess of hellebore breeding at Northwest Garden Nursery out of uh, Oregon. And they authored a book called A Tapestry Garden. It's not just about hellebores, but it's it, it, it's about their garden. Oh, and Pam's holding it up so we can see the cover. So Timber Press, the publisher, uh, has generously donated a copy. It, we are only, they can only mail to um, uh, North American audience, but I think that's who we have. So we'll do a drawing for that. And then we also have two sets of the Johnny's um, swag, uh, the logo hat and the hand cedar, which we'll uh, draw. So we have seven giveaways. And I um, just want to thank you all for participating. This will be recorded and we'll post it probably next week. And um, please put on your calendar um, our next monthly Slow Flowers member virtual meetup. Uh, we're going to go back to the second Friday of the month. And so it's March 12th, same time. And um, we are hoping to have our topic be about growing dye plants, growing and selecting dye plants and how they're used because a lot of people in um, the our world are diversifying and having dye plants for textile uh, projects is a, a natural extension of your farm or your floral floral business. So I'm excited about that. Look for more details and thank you all. This is a perk of being a member of Slow Flowers. And I want to thank you all for taking advantage of it today. And Riz, you're amazing. People are really inspired to go cut some branches and stems and put together an arrangement. So uh, thanks. And uh, Pam, 
you're equally inspiring. I think you've really opened, kind of demystified and opened up people's um, eyes to the possibilities. And just seeing the samples that you held up was really fun. And uh, I think you are a, more of a floral designer than you uh, let on, Pam, because your stuff is beautiful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. We'll see you in March. And we'll give a little uh, virtual hand wave to our amazing speakers, Pam and Riz.